Good afternoon, everyone. I want to call this meeting to order uh, January 21st, 2021 at uh, 1 01 p.m. So welcome and happy new year, everyone. I am council member Monica Montgomery Stepp. And this year I'm co-chairing with uh, this task force with supervisor Joel Anderson. Don't know if he's here yet. And as he hops in, I'll happily have him introduce himself. Um, we are joined at this task force with bank representatives and community partners together with, with input, um, with public input, the reinvestment task force is convened to number one, monitor and report bank lending performance. Number two, provide financial education and public information. And number three, serve in an advisory capacity to the city and the county of San Diego. And I do see, uh, I believe my new co-chair joining Supervisor Anderson. Hello and welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I was just getting started. If you'd like any uh, opening words at all, please feel free or just well, introduce yourself. Or... So I'm, uh, I replaced Diane Jacob and I'm looking forward to working with you all. And uh, I think this is a really important committee. So I'm, I'm proud to be on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And so we do have a lot to get to today. So let's go to item two, which is non-agenda public comment. Um, our meetings have gone virtual, obviously, and so have has our public comment. Persons who wish to address the members on an item to be considered at this meeting or provide non-agenda public comment may contribute live uh, audio only public comment by watching the meeting via Zoom uh, using Zoom's raise hand function during the item they wish to speak on and making their statement when told to do so uh, by the clerk. Uh, the raise hand feature can be found on the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. The clerk will call on, the, on each speaker in turn. Public spe speakers are limited to three minutes per person. So do we have any uh, non-agenda public comment speakers? Yes, we have one public comment. Trust Olson, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, this is Jeff calling from North Park. And uh, today I'm representing Public Bank San Diego. And I wanted to give you a quick update on um, what's happening in the world of public banking. Um, there is currently legislation pending before Congress that will make it easier at, for new public banks to uh, streamline their regulation process, make it easier for them to receive FDIC insurance. There's also pending legislation in Sacramento. There's a follow-up bill to AB 857 called AB 310, and it will create a new state of California public bank. <clears throat> There's also um, progress here in San Diego. Um, the public bank business plan, which is the next step in this process of the city creating its own public bank, um, the, the public bank business plan was approved by six out of nine of the uh, current city council members. Actually, it was included in their year-end budget priority memos. So um, it appears that the city council, a city council majority is prepared to pursue public banking here locally. And um, the, ver the next step will be for Mayor Gloria to issue an RFP so that we can have economists make bids on our business plan for a city of San Diego public bank. Um, and so that's where we're at. Thank you uh, to council member Monica Montgomery Stepp for including the public bank business plan in her year end budget priority memo. And um, you'll be hearing lots more about public banking in uh, the months and weeks to come. Thank you everyone. Thank okay. you. Um, we don't have any more public comments. Okay. Okay, that ends our non-agenda public comment, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, we are going to switch it up a little bit, uh, move some of our regular business towards the end so that our presenters can go. So we're gonna go now right to item six. Uh, this is an information item. Um, and it's the Community Reinvestment Act workshop. So the reason that we come together as the Reinvestment Task Force is largely due to 
of the Community Reinvestment Act or CRA passed in 1977 that encourages banks to do loans, investments and meet credit needs in low to moderate income communities. Um, and so the CRA was the federal response to redlining or the systemic practices that predominantly left out the black community from uh, building their wealth through home ownership. Um, today, we are joined by ex uh, guest experts from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, uh, California Reinvestment Coalition and Greenlining, who will present a workshop and training on the impact of CRA, federal proposals to change this landmark uh, civil rights law and advocacy tools. So we will hear from our, our guests first and then open it up for uh, public comment and then comments and questions from our task force members. Um, and so we have our presenters here, I believe Josh, Kevin and Rowan are all here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. I think the order Thank was you. gonna be Rowan, Kevin and then me. No, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just go ahead and share my screen. All right, so thank you again for having us. My name is Rowan Halabi. I'm the Senior Economic Equity Manager at the Greenlining Institute. We're based in Oakland um, and we work across the state. And I'm just gonna get us started with quickly going over um, the why the Community Reinvestment Act is so important. So redlining, like the council member just said, Redlining is a legal practice of denying services to communities of color. Um, and we know that it's just one in many injustices um, that communities of color face. One moment. Um, it sits upon a 400 year history of structural and institutional policies that have created the conditions that our communities face today. So from the founding of this country on the genocide of native, native people, to slavery, to the Chinese Exclusion Act, to Japanese internment, to Jim Crow, the list is endless, to redlining, to immigration camps, and now to the unequal impact of COVID-19. Um, we know that um, this has created the lived experience of communities of color today. For every dollar of wealth a white family has, the median black family has eight cents. These conditions have really perpetuated a massive wealth gap that persists today. Persists today. Um, and it's the result of deliberate policy choices. So it's therefore no surprise that we can draw a direct parallel between redlining, the communities that suffer the worst from pollution and then today, neighborhoods that are suffering the most from COVID-19. The same denominator between all of them is race. And so these outcomes, like I said, are the result of deliberate public policy decisions that were carried out by federal, state, and local government institutions and private corporations. Government policies created these injustices, so government policies can also play an important role in solving them. Greenlining, the organization that I work for and also a policy tool is the affirmative and proactive practice of providing economic opportunities to communities of color. My organization takes a targeted approach to ensuring that communities that experience the most harm receive the most care. Our mission is that we envision a nation where communities of color thrive and race is never a barrier to economic opportunity. And one of the tools to greenline communities is the Community Reinvestment Act. This is a federal law um, that requires large financial institutions to demonstrate to regulators that their lending, investments, and services adequately serve the communities in which they have market presence. So really, it requires federal banking agencies to assess the institution's record of meeting the credit needs of its entire community, including low-income neighborhoods, um, it ensures that they're consistent with safe and sound operation of a bank. Um, and they take those records into account in its evaluation um, when the banks are applying for um, merging or ac acquiring another institution. And what can the CRA do? 
for our communities, it can build wealth. So the CRA measures if a bank is meeting the credit needs of the community, i.e. is it making home loans and small business loans to LMI communities? Is it making investments in community development like affordable housing or an equity investment for a nonprofit or funding green space projects? And is it making philanthropic commitments to nonprofits, city of eyes, CDCs, or other small business and housing program support? CRA commitments can also include commitments to supply diversity or diverse hiring practices. And all of these investments can lead to the following that I have on the screen. It can increase ownership in homes, businesses, and community assets by people of color. It can increase community-driven investments in priority communities. It can produce good family-sustaining jobs. It can build community resilience to long-term impacts of natural and man-made crises. And it can grow healthy, regenerative environments. <clears throat> so my colleagues, Kevin and Josh, will go into greater detail of how CRA exams work and how you can leverage it to drive investments in your community. Thanks, Rowan. I think I'm up next. Um, I'm Kevin Stein uh, with the California Reinvestment Coalition. I want to thank you so much for, for inviting us to uh, be part of this conversation with the task force. And as Rowan suggested, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the, the how it works part of CRA. Um, and we'll see if I can do the how it works part of um, sharing my screen. So apologies if um, I am not successful immediately. Oh, here we go. Can you all see that? Yes, great, thank you. Um, so just quickly, um, the California Reinvestment Coalition, we're a statewide coalition of about 300 nonprofits throughout California. And we're really striving to get financial institutions to better serve low-income communities and communities of color. And that's primarily through reinvesting more into communities and to ceasing harmful and abusive and predatory practices. Um, we have worked with the Community Reinvestment Act to generate about $40 billion in reinvestment over the last few years. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, so as Rowan mentioned, CRA is the nation's anti-redlining law. Um, and as the council member and the chair noted, you know, why are we talking about this? Why is it important? The CRA is what brings you all together. It's what's bringing us together. From our perspective, to the extent banks are engaged at all, in working with LMI communities and communities of color, it is because of the Community Reinvestment Act, and more specifically, how they view what the rules require of them. So this conversation is really important. It may seem a little you know, um, discreet and uh, abstract at times, but it's really setting the blueprint for what banks will think they need to do in communities in San Diego and beyond. Um, and, uh, citing uh, Congressman Meeks, the CRA is a civil rights bill. Um, so this is very high level. The how does it work? CRA is overseen by three banking regulators. And um, there are two main inflection points, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So the bank's record in serving communities, low-income communities, um, will be considered every few years when the bank's regulators give an exam and ultimately a, a grade, a CRA rating. And the other main way in which CRA is significant um, and provides some leverage for community voices is when a bank seeks to grow its business, either by merging or applying to the regulators for permission to expand in some way. And during that process, the, the regulators are supposed to consider the bank's record in serving the credit needs of communities, including LMI communities. Um, we think community input and public participation are a critical component of CRA. So we're really enthused by the prospect that the task force will continue and maybe members of the public will get more engaged in commenting. Um, and we, we certainly agree that the CRA has room for improvement. Okay, so I mentioned these two points of leverage or uh, inflection points. 
the public can comment on these CRA exams that are given every few years. Um, and we periodically will submit comments. And here's just one example. Um, you know, another way to think about CRA and public input is the community is identifying what our community needs that the bank should address. And we identified a, a concern around displacement of low-income communities and communities of color and the extent to which banks were involved. We called their involvement um, displacement, the financing of displacement through displacement mortgages. And we became concerned about one institution that we felt was um, involved in making a large number of loans to landlords that were buying rent control buildings, evicting all the tenants, and then removing the properties from rent control. So very harmful to the community. And yet maybe getting CRA credit because the loans were made in low and moderate income neighborhoods. So we commented, and here's a, a map of um, a large number of loans made to problematic landlords. This is Oakland, in formerly redlined areas of Oakland, West Oakland in particular, um, where the landlords were deemed problematic by community groups and ultimately filed hundreds of eviction petitions with the local rent board. So we raised this concern. Um, in the in the public comment process as part of the exam, um, it's hard to say. Did that have a huge impact on the on the rating uh, of the bank? Um, the bank got a satisfactory rating, but did change its practices. And we believe that this concern is now on the regulators' radar, and that banks will have a hard time getting credit for these kinds of practices. Um, and I'll sorry, I'll try and move a little quicker. The other major way in which communities have a voice is through a merger process. Um, and I give this example of um, we worked with a large number of groups in protesting a merger a few years ago of One West Bank. We felt uh, if this is a map of uh, branches that r ring around neighborhoods of color in the greater LA area. So, you know, the bank not well serving communities of color and low income communities. This is a map, this is a chart reflecting a large number of foreclosures the bank processed in relation to the small number of mortgages, all in neighbors, neighborhoods of color. So the bank was not well serving the community, not reinvesting very well, foreclosing at a much higher rate than making mortgages. We raised all these concerns with the regulators. Um, the regulators did listen. There were a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth. There were public hearings held. Ultimately, the merger was approved with conditions. We continued to raise concerns, including through the public comment process for future exams. And we ultimately filed a redlining complaint. And maybe this is of uh, interest to the, to the um, task force and the public. So a year and a half ago, we were able to negotiate a CRA agreement with the same bank as it embarked on a new merger. And here are the kinds of things that the CRA kind of facilitates. So we facilitated dialogue with the bank. We brought our members to the table. The bank ultimately agreed that it would make specific commitments to the tune of $6.5 billion to reinvest in California communities in Southern California for the things that Rowan mentioned, single family lending, multifamily lending, small business lending, community development, and contributions to nonprofit organizations, opening branches, foreclosure prevention, fighting displacement, and continuing the dialogue. So we, we think that was a tough, uh, a tough history that resulted in a good outcome for communities. Um, and then fast forward, I'll just say, so the, the folks that kind of ran that bank became officials in the, in the last administration and proceeded to change the rules. So we're talking about the importance of the rules. And one of the bank regulators proposed some really harmful rules that we think would allow for discrimination and less reinvestment in the community. CRC and NCRC are suing to stop that. But at the same time, we're looking forward to the Federal Reserve, the other banking regulator, which is proposing different rules that Josh will talk more about. And the last thing I'll note is, you know, mergers continue. There are continuing 
opportunities for the public to comment. And if people are interested in any of this, they can follow up with any of us. Um, and we are happy at CRC to, t to talk with folks and work with them on trying to hold banks more accountable to serve the community. Thank you so much. Kevin, if you can unscreen, un end your screen share, because I'm going to share a screen in a second. Thank you. Um, well, we're on and Kevin, those are great presentations and I think really provide a wonderful background of what CRA and why it is important. Um, a strong CRA means so much for our communities. Just the bottom line, more loans, investments and bank services for low moderate income communities and communities of color. So what I'm gonna talk about in my time is um, how the federal agencies are proposing to change the rules. CRA, how does it work? Basically it's an exam. And uh, you know, you remember when you were in school, you got, you got a report card um, and you got grades on different subjects. And uh, imagine if your report card was publicly available on the internet. Um, and it said you got a C in math and a D in Spanish. And when do you work a little harder? I would have if uh, my uh, grades were on the Internet. That's the genius of CRA. Banks grades are on the Internet. Anybody can pull down a CRA exam. And when a bank is being graded, anyone can comment on a CRA exam. But the, the grading is only going to be as rigorous as the rules uh, for the exam. So you have three bank regulators that have CRA responsibility. Wouldn't it be easier if there was just one? But uh, there are two regulators that have acted so far, um, as Kevin mentioned. Uh, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and uh, the Federal Reserve Board. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency issued such a bad rule and that would be so damaging that would decrease reinvestment in our communities, that the National Community Reinvestment Coalition and the California Reinvestment Coalition sued. And it's actually in court right now. Um, actually, I don't even know if I introduced myself. Josh Silver, National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Um, so um, let me just really briefly talk about how awful uh, the Office of the Comptroller Currency final, it's actually a final rule that we hope gets revoked uh, when the new administration comes in and the Biden administration is going to appoint a new head for the OCC. But just to give you a, a sense of how awful this rule is, what you measure is what you get. Uh, your perform the, the, the measure on the exam will basically determine what banks do. And let me try to describe the OCC measure. It's the dollar amount of CRA activities divide by deposits, the dollar amount of CRA activity. So you might think, okay, that makes some sense. But what does that ratio do? It encourages banks to go for the largest deal, the, the largest money deal, despite the needs for smaller, small business loans in communities, uh, other types of lending that's really a smaller dollar amount. Um, and also what the OCC did is that large infrastructure projects that have a partial benefit to low and moderate income people will count. A partial benefit, large infrastructure, Golden Gate Bridge rehabilitation. That bridge is always being, no, no offense to San Francisco, but that bridge is always being rehabilitated, right? So the bank could say, I'm just gonna rehabilitate the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm not gonna worry about lending, investing in services in low and moderate income communities. What that new rule could do is a new era of redlining in low and moderate income communities. So. Along comes the Federal Reserve Board. I never would think of the Federal Reserve Board as a hero, and they're far from a hero, but their approach is considerably better than the OCC. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for a second. Um, and let me see, how come I'm not seeing what I, uh, give me, bear with me for one second. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, can you see a nice little picture of a city, uh, Treasure CRA? Uh, Kevin, put your thumbs up. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, this will become more relevant in a second. Um, this is our website. Uh, it's called Treasure CRA, and this actually will give you 
uh, tools for commenting on the Federal Reserve's proposals. Uh, you can see the uh, URL here. All you actually have to do is just Google Treasure CRA. So um, real brief, what is the Federal Reserve proposing to do? Uh, instead of one ratio, like the OCC, being the major part of the grade, the Fed is saying, we're going to give you a lending test, a community development test, and a service test. And the reason why you need these separate tests is to make sure that banks are lending, making home loans in low and moderate income communities, small business loans. Community development financing is like a low income housing tax credit deal or a construction loan for rental housing or an investment, equity investments um, in small business vehicles, for example. So that's a community development test. And the service test is branching. Are you making branches and deposit accounts available in low and moderate income communities? Basically, the Fed is building on the current measures. Those are the current measures on the CRA exam. And we think that's the right direction. The geographical areas on CRA exams and by the way, so if you scroll down to the middle of this web page, you'll see take action and then you'll see tell regulators. You hit that tab and this explains how you submit a comment letter. Comments are due on February 16th. The email that you use to send your comments uh, and then you have sample letter letters. Um, I'm actually going to click on to the long sample comment letter. Strengthening CRA is critical to the recovery from COVID and the pandemic, for example. Um, okay, so geographical areas on CRA exams, right now where, they are where bank branches are. And that's very important because a lot of brand, banks make loans through bank branches. But you know, online banking is coming of age, internet banks. So the Fed is thinking about adding additional geographical areas on CRA exams where a bank is just doing a lot of lending and lending, including lending outside of its branch network. And that's very important. And that could help um, areas, say in California, that don't have as much bank branches, for example. Uh, think of um, you know, areas in the valley, more rural areas. Um, so geographical areas on CRA exams. What counts on CRA exams? Well, I talked, I explained about OCC and partially benefiting low and moderate income. No, the focus must remain on low and moderate income neighborhoods and low and moderate income people. The Fed gets this mostly right, but the Fed is saying, oh, maybe financial education for any income level. You know, we actually, we disagree with that. Because um, think about financial advisors for middle and upper income people. Um, and banks actually have financial advising services, you know, where you put your money market funds. Um, uh, what's really more important for CRA, a lot more important is financial education, getting people banked, uh, people who are not in the banking system. Combating grade inflation, 98% of banks pass. Uh, I'm not saying that 50% of the banks should fail, but 90% of banks get a satisfactory rating. If we split that into like, that's like a B. If we split that in half, like half of them get B and half of them get C, we would actually be motivating a lot more banks to do better on uh, lending, investing in services in low and moderate income communities. The Fed's a little coy about CRA grade inflation. So you see that header here, must, uh, the Federal Reserve proposal must be strengthened to prevent grade inflation. Improved, uh, I'm gonna get to uh, communities and people of color in a second. Data collection, sounds really nerdy, uh, but the, uh, a very important area of improving data collection is on community development activities, like your construction loan for rental, for example. Very, very important. But, all, but last but not least, uh, how, how, um, how should CRA deal better target communities of color? And why have, I, why have we been saying low and moderate income people and low and moderate income communities? CRA was passed in 1977. Senator William Proxmire was really the architect of CRA. And if you remember the 1970s, uh, there was a backlash against busing. There was a backlash against affirmative action. It was probably the case that Proxmire did not have the votes if he put race, you know, measuring loans, investments, and services in communities of color in the statute. 
So because communities of color is not in the statute, the regulators have shied away from, you know, explicitly measuring percent of loans, say, to people of color or percent of loans in communities, communities of color. We want the Fed to take another look at this to see if they can, uh, you know, if it passes statutory muster. Uh, NCRC has also um, developed proxies, percent of loans in underserved communities, uh, which you can measure by low levels of lending. And that actually turns out to be a lot of communities of color. But doing a much better job addressing the lack of lending and investing in communities of color. Comment period ends on February 16th. We have sample comment letters. And the exam is only as good as the rules governing the exam. And uh, the exam ultimately is also only as good as it provides opportunities for the public to comment and be engaged. So I will stop there. And thank you so much for inviting us on this very important topic. Absolutely, thank you so much for being here uh, and for presenting all of that information, information from this perspective of ensuring that our communities have the appropriate investment, which was the spirit of uh, this, of the CRA. So we're gonna go to public comment. Um, and so Karen, if there are any uh, public comment, they can proceed now. Okay, David Otto, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay, you should be unmuted now. David, you may begin. Oh, and actually, let me just say real quickly, David Otto is a local hero. He has been using lending data for literally more than two decades. And sometimes he talks to talks to me and my colleagues. So I hope he can talk. Um, and, you know, kudos to you, David. David, you are unmuted, so you can um, begin. So I don't, I don't know if we're experiencing uh, technical difficulties right now with the public comment or Mr. Otto. Um, let's try to, to work through that as okay. we, and, 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 and Karen, if you let me know as soon as we get it taken care of, we'll go right back to Mr. Otto and, okay. and let's just go forward with some uh, board member comments. And if you would, um, indulge me by uh, raising your hand uh, with the participants tab, then that way we can, uh, we won't, I won't be skipping over folks okay. or anything like that. It looks like we have um, two additional um, comments from the public. Uh, okay. So we can start with Chris Lee and then move on to Samantha. Okay. Um, Chris, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Okay, there we go. Uh, and there we you go. are unmuted. Okay. Is that working? Yep, yes, we can hear you. Great. So I, I guess my, my comment was, so we talked about targeting people of color versus income, low income populations, which I think is, is great, except for the fact that when I've uh, collected data, I have found that, that if I target low income areas, the people of color and people of different languages, it, it, it just mirrors so much that, that I, 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 it, it just makes me question if efforts towards targeting people of color versus um, the low income is gonna really make a difference. I guess it's more of a comment than a question, but um, I'm just saying that's what I have found. A quick, very quick response. Um, I think it depends on Ms. your community. Mr. Silver, I'd love, oh. let me, um, if you could just keep that I'm in mind. I'm not supposed mind. to talk right yeah, and then we'll just move through public comment and then I'll come directly back to you before we go to board comment, just to answer and get through. Okay, Karen, we can go to our next. Uh, okay, uh, Samantha, I'm gonna allow you to talk and then David, I'm gonna go back to you and see if um, we are able to hear you. 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a homeowner in the community that was previously redlined and um, consistently sees uh, less appreciation of home values and equity than other communities. And I'm wondering how the uh, the Reinvestment Act and, and this organization can work towards improving that status when um, members of communities like mine get told that because we don't have development in our community, that we don't get access to certain opportunities and resources. That's the extent of my comments, thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, Karen, can we, okay. Mr. Otto? Yes, I'm gonna move on to David, yes. And, uh, okay, David, you are unmuted. David, are you connected to audio? Um, you are unmuted, so you should be able to, to speak. Um, maybe if you wanna chat your, put your comments in the chat. I'm not, we, we're not able to hear you. Okay. Uh, let's keep an eye on that and go ahead and move forward. Mr. Silver, I want to give you the opportunity to, to respond to some of the public comments. Um, well, just real quickly, why people of color? Um, I think it depends on your um, community. Um, there, are, there are some communities where there's overlap, but there's other communities where there's not as much overlap. Um, and in my area of um, you know district, uh, Maryland and Virginia, just give you a quick example. Um, I live in Montgomery County and one county to the east of me, Prince George's County is um, predominantly African-American and um, most of it is middle upcome, middle income and even upper income. And during the financial crisis, it was ravaged by foreclosures. And why was it ravaged by foreclosures? You had a lot of subprime high cost lenders making loans in PG in Prince George's County because traditional banks were not serving uh, Prince George's County. So um, for communities like uh, Prince George's County, it is important to include communities of color. And I don't think it will be a zero sum. You add people, communities of color, there'll be less for low and moderate income. I think there is a case to be made that banks are not doing enough now. So that if you add communities of color, it's not zero sum. I think it's plus sum. I think you can get more uh, reinvestment in low and moderate income communities as well as communities of color. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so we're going to uh, go to board comments now. Um, if anyone has any comments about the presentation before we move to item seven, um, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, if, if our co chair, Supervisor Anderson, has anything at all. Okay, Antonio, and then and, and I, I see you, Antonio, please go ahead, but there is a function in the in the participants tab. Uh, so just in case I'm not able to see you on my screen, everyone just raise your hand that way. And I, and I couldn't find it. So. Oh, okay, no problem. So yeah, my question is for the green lining presentation, uh, Rowan, you mentioned the wealth gap and I think it was at the national level. Is there a way to have access to that information at a county level? And if, if you have it, can you share maybe in the future with, with the RTF? Um, I'm not sure if I can respond right now. Yeah, 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 no, go. Oh, sorry. Now out of, I'm sorry, I'll make it clarification. For public comment, that is uh, for public and then we can respond when we go to board member comments, but go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, yes, that was national data that pre I presented. Um, I haven't seen it at the county level. Um, I do have access to at the state level. Um, so I'm assuming you can get the county, but I can look into that and pass that on. Okay, 
Okay, I, great. I don't <laughs> think county level uh, wealth data is available. Um, it's one of the <laughs> data collection needs to be much better in the United States, actually. But definitely poke around. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I just had a question real quick about this settlement. Uh, I think Kevin, I, I think that was in your presentation um, and about, um, I think you laid out dollar amounts, but I wanted to know, is that on top of um, what the CRA already uh, currently requires? Was it set aside and is it monitored? How do I want to know some of the ins and outs about that? So. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. So we actually had a couple of settlements. Um, this was with CIT in particular. One West became was bought by CIT. We alleged that they were redlining communities. If you think of those maps, they're not serving communities of color. We settled. Um, we settled that a year and a half ago, and then a bit later, we entered into a CRA agreement. So we have both of these. The the, the redlining settlement is legally binding. Um, and the CRA agreement is not, is, is not, um, but we believe that they, you know, that banks plan to intend to honor those agreements. And we arrange and NCRC does this and green lining does this, um, and a task force, I think used to do this and could do this, you know, is to, um, set meetings, follow up meetings to monitor, uh, either a bank's commitments made or just to find out what they're doing in the community. So there is that opportunity. What does the CRA require? That's really a tricky question. The CRA doesn't require, you couldn't say what it requires in particular in terms of amount. And, you know, I once heard someone from the Federal Reserve say the CRA is a mushy law. It's not entirely clear. And I think what we're all trying to do, including the task force, is to try and bring some clarity to that mushy process. So we look to the community participation process to engage banks and have a conversation and say, you're supposed to meet community needs. This is what we think those needs are. This is what the task force says the needs are in, the, in San Diego. And we want you to address them. And we can talk with you about what that looks like and then come back and tell us that you're doing it. We think those commitments that come out of those conversations are above and beyond what banks would otherwise do. And maybe this is unfair, but again, I think banks will, from our perspective, the banks will only do what is required to do. They're required to do. If the CRA is not particularly clear, they're not gonna do very much. If there was no CRA, maybe there'd be no task force. If the rules are soft, the banks will do less. And that's what the concern was from NCRC, CRC, Greenlining, and all the community groups, and I believe the task force, I think the task force weighed in on this, that the OCC's rule would have lowered the bar and allowed banks to say, we can do less and still meet our obligations under the CRA. So we're, we're all trying to kind of fill in the gaps and you know make clear what the obligations should be. And this is one way to do it, to engage. It's really about engagement. For us, we like to reflect it in a plan, a commitment that we can all look at and agree on. We think that helps them set their goals, that they do plan to, you know, they internally, they set themselves up to meet those commitments and we can talk about when they don't. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, Frank, you have your hand raised. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, thank you for all three groups. Uh, I think everybody else who's a banker knows each one of the groups uh, very well. Uh, so it, 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 as far as it, it, for advice or anything else, so that's my question really. Um, CRA was written in 77, just like the Equal Credit Opportunity, which defined minorities, was written in 72. I mean, people from North Africa are not considered a minority. So you got issues and things of that nature. I hope both are going to change. My question is around CRA modernization. And I know that is a topic that each one of you are intimately involved in. That could take hours for you guys to debate. But what I really want to know is, are you guys having ongoing debates on what that would look like? 
And would you somehow make that available to us so maybe we can list it in to see what your plans are? Are you putting it on your website to see how you feel like, what are the changes that are going to be needed under CRA? Um, it's important for each one of us. I think all of us have a passion around doing the right things in communities of color and in low to moderate income communities. And they are different. Um, I was a little bit taken back. I, I personally, uh, one of the comments that was made earlier about they were the same, you know, somebody in a community and they're also the low to moderate. That's not the truth. I mean, there are affluent African-Americans and um, I'm a little bit taken aback and I apologize for the length of my question on that because I, there is an actual distinction. And uh, so, uh, but I wanted to talk about a little bit about CRA uh, modernization and where you think it's gonna go. So um, this is Josh Silver, um, real quick. Um, a lot of the topics that the Fed is touching, um, and you know, we want, in some cases, the Fed to address them in a different way, but a lot of these topics are very important topics for CRA mod, you know, geographical areas and CRA exams, what counts on CRA. Um, you know, my, my, one of my pet peeves is combating grade inflation, um, improving data collection. Um, but it also, to, in answer to your question, Frank, um, uh, we not only banks, uh, non applying CRA to non banks is going to be very, very important because banks are losing out in some very important competition against non banks. Mortgage companies, independent mortgage companies now make about 50% or more of the home loans and they're not, they're not covered by CRA. Um, insurance companies, we used to talk about a lot about redlining by insurance companies. Um, and, you know, President Biden, when he was campaigning, had apply CRA to insurance companies. And actually, California has something. It's voluntary. It's called COIN, but it's about trying to get insurance companies to make investments in, you know, underserved communities. Uh, but I think also data should be collected on where the insurance companies are making their policies. You know, can you get a homeowner's policy if you live in a community of color, for example? And last but not least, we talk about wealth inequalities. A lot of it's driven by inequalities in home ownership, but also stocks and bonds. Um, there is a disparity, racial and income disparity in uh, ownership of stocks and bonds. And, um, you know, applying CRA to securities firms and investment banks. And I'm actually going to try to find a blog I wrote and stick it in the chat that talks about uh, kind of CRA for non-banks. So thanks for that question. Thank you. Talking to myself, that's what we do. We don't press mute. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Um, I also have Stephen's hand, hand is up. Yes, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, Supervisor Anderson, it's very nice to meet you. Stephen Russell with the San Diego Housing Federation uh, and all of our friends here in the CRA. I think the issue that uh, Josh was just talking about, about non-CRA, um, uh, entities, current, current entities that are not currently uh, uh, regulated by, by CRA is significant. And I have a history going back 20 years of, of attending these meetings. Um, and back around 2000, 2002, the, the CRA regulated entities here funded a lot of work around non-CRA lending, around predatory lending taking place in our communities. And I'm just curious if that is a common occurrence amongst us, you know, uh, regional CRA uh, efforts, but it was really prescient. I think that Jim Bleisner, who was leading that effort at the time, saw uh, the, the coming wave of predatory lending that really led in many ways to uh, the, the, the larger mortgage uh, collapse uh, that, that came later. But I, I will ask the question to Josh, is that is that kind of activity of CRA entities funding research into non-CRA entities and actually maybe identifying places where they could be doing business, is that is that kind of model done anywhere in the present time? Well, there is CRA for mortgage companies in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and actually, Illinois just passed CRA for mortgage companies. Um, so, um, and actually, see, and Massachusetts also has CRA for credit unions. Um, so, hopefully, um, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what we can do in the next couple of years on the federal level. But um, hopefully, it's coming. And in more states, hopefully, we'll take action too. 
Yeah, I think, and I think my point there is partly that the the CRA regulated entities here who are you know, have a proven track record of trying to be, uh, you know, good community members may have an interest in, uh, let's, let's just call it driving out some of the bad actors, calling them out and driving them out. I think you're right. Um, and I actually think um, sometimes we get some quiet support from the bank trade associations when we talk about CRA for credit unions. Well, if, if I may, just one, one point, um, maybe less, optimistically so um we're we're you know the banks do so much good and they can do so much do good they also sometimes do harm and we're we're really concerned about the harm we're very aware of the harm the cra really doesn't take that into account very well so that's one point with this process that's going on now with cra reform from the regulatory standpoint and the Federal Reserve's process and the OCC's process. We think CRA should allow for downgrading when banks are discriminating, when they're displacing, and when they're financing the bad actors. So yes, in many cases, the bad actors are not necessarily national banks, but they are companies that used to be, like during the subprime crisis, many of them were owned by banks. They were all financed by banks. And, you know, we think we would like to see financial institutions look at not only what they're doing, but who they're financing. And I would extend that also to what policies they're supporting or opposing. Because in many instances, when we're in Sacramento, for example, we're up against the banking trade associations always. And it would be nice if, you know, protecting people and allowing them to stay in their homes and fighting predatory financial practices, is that something we could agree on? We should be able to. So I would just like extend the point and, and maybe hope that banks would not only be involved in doing good, but doing good across the board and minimizing harm across the board. Yeah, thank you uh, for that answer too. Um, we are just, we have, if there are no other board members, uh, task force members that have comments at this time, before we move to item seven, we're gonna pick up on two more public comments and then we're gonna move to item seven after that. So Karen, if you could um, proceed with the additional public comment. Yes, yeah, so we have your trust. I'm gonna allow you to talk and unmute. Beatrice. If not, I'll move on to Stephen, and then we can come back to Beatrice. Um, Stephen, I am allowing you to talk and asking you to unmute. Thank you. Hi. Um, I would like to just make a comment. It's been alluded to a couple of times in the presentation today that the Community Reinvestment Act does set a, a minimum in terms of what banks, uh, or it sets the bar at a relatively low level for what banks should be doing. There seems to me, there seems to be very little incentive to do more than that. And I think we continue uh, to come, at least for me, I continue to come back to the question as to why is it that we uh, collectively must have to continue to push and urge banks to correct a trend and very much uh, issues that they helped to create over decades through various policies. Um, and it seems to me that here we are now, years, couple decades almost since the passing of the CRA, and we continue to have to for uh, uh, pressure banks into meeting these minimal obligations under the CRA. Um, the, the reason I think why that is has to be addressed. And I think when ultimate profit incentive is the motivation of the banks, there is no underlying 
uh, obligation of the banks to truly address these issues on a community level. Um, I think our earlier uh, public comment indicated uh, San Diego uh, making steps towards uh, exploring public banking options. Public banking option removes for that, that private profit incentive out and truly enables the community to identify what those needs are and utilize its resources towards those ends. So at some point, I would love to get some feedback from those at the NCRC um, and, the CR, uh, and the CRA in regards to their understanding and position on public banking. And that's it. Madam Chair, if I may, just quickly, we, we supported a bill in the last session for a state public bank, and we're expecting to bring that bank back this session. So California Reinvestment Coalition, very much in favor of public bank. Um, and you know, if you're interested, you can follow up afterwards. Um, I think also you, you kind of, as do all the questions, it kind of makes the argument for responding to this current process that we have open. You know, Josh is laying out the Federal Reserve is asking us, what should CRA be? You know, all the financial institutions represented here and others, they do things in the community. We may wish that it were more, but they do things because of what exists with regard to CRA. The, the, Fed, was, the Fed is asking, what should it be? If we think the bar has been low and the OCC lowered the bar, we should be urging the Fed to raise the bar and set thresholds high and benchmarks high. And that would be great for a comment. And we should also at the same time, you know, let's press, let's, let's hope that banks will do more and that they'll be encouraged to do more or required to do more. And let's also push for a public bank. Um, yeah, Josh Silver, real quick, um, basically just echo what Kevin just said. Um, there have been some studies that, um, you know, Federal Reserve of Pennsylvania, if you took CRA away from low and moderate income communities, lending would decrease 10 or 20 percent. Um, you know, that may not seem like a whole huge amount, but that makes probably makes a difference um, in a lot of cases between a viable neighborhood and the neighborhood that's not vi viable. But I think it can be it can have a larger impact. And really, uh, one of the mechanisms here is what does your exam look like and what does your exam measure? Um, and are 98 percent of the banks going to pass, continue to pass? Are 90 percent of the banks going to continue to get the same grade? So I think if we can make the exams a little tougher, that 10 or 20 percent impact in lending in low moderate income communities can be higher. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. And also, Josh, we see your link and we are putting it on our website. So thank you so much for that. Great. Uh, thanks. Thank you. So um, let's move on to item number seven. Um, this is another information item, green mining report on home lending to communities of color. Um, so every year this task force produces an annual RTF member banking lending report where we can see the loans and the investments made by our member banks, Bank of America, Citibank, JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Union Bank and US Bank. Uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act allows us to look at housing loan data uh, from all lenders, including non-banks like uh, credit unions. This data is another tool to see how our lenders are serving housing needs, uh, helps assist public officials in distributing public investment and can help identify possible discriminatory uh, lending practices. I'm excited to have Rowan uh, come again, but this time sharing her reports on home lending to communities of color in California and specifically in San Diego County. So uh, please take it away, your, the floor is, is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so again, I will share my screen. Um, so what I probably didn't do a great job of explaining previously is that the Green Mining Institute, we're a policy and advocacy organization and we work on all, all issues related to communities of color, um, the economic equity team that I sit on worked specifically for the last 25 years on bank, banking accountability, regulations, and really increasing access to wealth and home ownership in order to close the racial wealth gap. So 
this is a report that we've done pretty regularly. Um, this year's report used data collected using the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act in 2019. Um, and we looked at lending in California and in six major metropolitan areas. We looked at Sacramento, San Francisco, Oakland, Fresno, LA, and San Diego. Um, and to begin, I just wanna kind of give an overview of um, the state of home ownership and the racial wealth divide right now. As we know, housing prices continue to rise and the housing market expands against the backdrop of the economic fallout of COVID-19 and communities of color continue to be excluded from home ownership, which we know is a crucial wealth building vehicle in the US. Um, home ownership rates are not equally distributed along racial and ethnic lines and people of color, the data shows this, do not access mortgages at equal rates as their white counterparts. Um, the national black home ownership rate has dropped to 44% compared to a national home ownership rate of 65%. And financial institutions play a critical role in the home ownership gap between people of color and white people. These factors include uh, inaccessible products and services, lower branch presence in communities of color, and just an inability to meet the needs of communities that have been long locked out of traditional pathways to home ownership, um, including a lack of intergenerational wealth. Um, so in our analysis, we found the following, that like I said, communities of color do not access home, home loans at rates comparable to white communities. So we found in the 2019 data that Black and Latino and Native American home buyers receive far fewer home purchase loans in California than white people, and that people of color receive only about 60% of what would be expected based on their percentage of the state's population. We also found that women of color receive 7% of home loans by California's top lenders while making up 30% of California's population. Now we decided to look specifically at women of color because women of color are more likely to be heads of households um, and have more responsibility for providing for childcare and extended families while also overcoming a gender pay gap and a racial wealth gap. We also found that low income white borrowers are more likely than low income borrowers of color to receive a home loan. And we found that non-bank lenders dominate several regional markets in California and play an increasing role in home lending across the state. So non-bank lenders like FinTechs and other non-depository mortgage institutions, <clears throat> including credit unions, dominate several markets in California and are more likely to make loans to low-income borrowers than traditional banks may. Nine of the top 15 home lenders are unregulated non-banks um, that do not offer traditional banking services. They operate largely online and are not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. So their lending is not regularly assessed to determine whether they meet the credit and borrowing needs of the communities where they operate. Non-bank lenders are also more likely to make home loans to low-income borrowers than traditional banks. So in our analysis, Black and Latino households were more likely than other racial groups to access home purchase loans from non-bank lenders. Um, we also found, you know, home lending is changing and the emergence of FinTech and the decreasing presence of physical branches, particularly in LMI and communities of color um, is alarming. Um, non-bank lenders tend to be more effective um, than mainstream banks that reaching communities of color, um, low income and immigrant communities, all of which are highly vulnerable to predatory lending. Um, and again, are not subject to the CRA. So I can kind of dig deeper into the data um, and just kind of give an overview of the state of home lending in California before I dive into San Diego. Um, like I said, we used home mortgage data collected 
under Hamda to provide insight into the lending patterns. Um, we looked specifically at um, home purchase loans for single family or manufactured homes in the Humda in the 2019 data set. In California, um, and I'll send a link to the report so you can kind of go into all of the graphs and the tables for each of the regions. Um, but here, I just wanna point out home loans by race. In California, black and Latino households are underrepresented in mortgage lending. So home lending to Asian households um, slightly exceeded their share of the population and home lending to white households um, far exceeded or did exceed their share of the population. So you'll see that the black population in California is 5.5%, but only received 3.28% of the loans. The Latino population is 39.4%, but received 21.89% of the loans. In San Diego, the data is similar. Um, the black population makes up 4.78% um, of the population, but black community only receives 2.6% of the loans. And even worse, the Latino population is 33.96% of the population, but receives about less than half of the loan originations. So um, if you look, this is looking at all lenders, not just the top 15 lenders. If you look at the top 15 lenders, um, which account for 54% of the market um, by race of the top 15 lenders, only two lenders make home purchase loans to black households at a level representative of the 5% um, black population in the region. And so those are Navy Federal and um, the Freedom Mortgage Corporation, an online lender. Um, you can also see that non-banks make up, uh, or the, the top lender in San Diego is a non-bank and it makes up 11% of the market. Um, and non-banks generally uh, make up a good chunk of the San Diego market. I think in other metropolitan regions that we studied, um, this was even more stark with far less traditional bank presence um, than we see here in San Diego. So what do we recommend? Um, really, the mortgage market is evolving. Online lenders will continue to increase in their presence. Um, Greenlining believes that competition is important and we think that this will just drive traditional banks to be even better, stronger leaders in this area and offering equitable, safe and affordable products. Um, but right now we wanna see across the board from all lenders, more loan products and outreach tailored to low and moderate um, income fam families. So um, that's the first thing. Uh, the other important policy recommendations, we wanna see more funding to nonprofits led by people of color that support home ownership counseling. We saw anecdotally when um, presenting this to the Green Lining Coalition, which is made up of nonprofit organizations, um, the communities that receive home loans are doing so through the support of homeowners, home ownership counseling um, and other critical nonprofits. And we wanna see more support to those organizations. We also wanna see increased branch presence in rural communities, um, as well as for broadband deployment in order to increase access to online lending for those communities. In communities like Fresno and Sacramento, there is less than a handful of traditional banks and there are many areas that don't have any physical branches um, to support with building banking relationships that need, um, that need to exist in order to, to move forward in the lending process. We also wanna see increased cultural competency in both products and marketing. We know that non-bank lenders have dedicated marketing teams um, in multiple languages, um, especially I think in places like San Diego. Um, lenders should really invest heavily though um, in ethnic media for their marketing efforts. Um, in order to ensure that they reach consumers that are not well served by mainstream media, um, as well as to support businesses owned by people of color. We also wanna see 
um, that lenders are prioritizing um, safe loans delivered equitably um, and in services, uh, sorry, delivering services in languages um, spoken by California's diverse communities. We also wanna see more targeted support from federal and state regulators. So at the federal level, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act has a lot of work to do. Um, it should be made stronger, more accessible, with e easier to access data that is um, completely filled out. In our analysis, we found that I believe 11% of the loans that were documented had race not available listed. So that's missing data that's important for um, consumers and organizations to um, properly hold banks accountable. Um, we also want to see at the state level, California regulators leading the discussion around um, the evolving tech mortgage industry um, with the goal of incentivizing both innovation, but also lowering costs and um, protecting consumers and underserved communities. And obviously the most critical um, uh, policy recommendation would be to see these non-bank lenders included um, it, under the Community Reinvestment Act to really ensure that um, low-income communities are protected and considered by the non-bank lenders. There's, um, I haven't done the math, but there's quite a bit of um, investments that these communities are losing out um, by the non-bank lenders not being beholden to the CRA. So um, that's kind of an overview of the report. I will include it in the chat um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it, feel free to include it in the chat. It is already, the link to your report is already on our agenda as well for the public. So anyone that wants to review it in, in more detail, uh, please go to our meeting agenda. A lot of uh, good information and a great overview. So at this time, um, we have no, um, public comments. I just want to make sure that the public, no one wants to comment at this time, because after we go to member comments, we will be going to item number eight to ensure we have time to get to uh, all the information that we need. So I see there might be someone raising their hand and putting it back down. I wanna make sure you have the opportunity to speak. So I see, uh, well, okay, so Karen, can you call the public comment, please? You may begin, Gustavo, you are unmuted. Hi, thank you, uh, Karen, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, quick question for Rowan. Uh, I'm just, I'm curious, as a former banker, um, I'm always, I, I always try to, analyze you know, what would be the best way to increase lending capacity or the lending period to a certain LMI community, understanding that there's limited income, maybe prohibitive credit scores. So I'd like to inquire, uh, what advice would you provide Rowan when you're trying to do more lending within an LMI community? How would you recommend we offset that with possible maybe lower than Oh, okay, uh, thank you, Gustavo. We will turn it over now to Ruan and then board member comments. Yeah, I think, um, I honestly think the, the board members here are probably better suited to answer the question, but um, one of the things that in discussing with community members and our coalition um, is more culturally competent um, underwriting. And so we want to see underwriting that takes into consideration um, the circumstances of many of these communities. And that can look like multi, uh, multiple incomes, different potentially small businesses or micro businesses, um, consideration for multiple families living in a home, um, things like that that can make the underwriting process really stressful and confusing for many of these community members. Um, just a consideration and understanding for that and set processes for those things. Um, 
is, is, is one of the biggest recommendations that we find, but also just um, programs that provide that down payment assistance and that um, just lower rates and um, yeah, the, the specifics, I think the board is better suited to answer, but um, that's kind of a starting point. Okay, thank you. And we will turn it over to the board if any of our uh, members have any additional comments to follow up on that or anything else, any other questions that you have about this presentation. Yes, Stephen. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, thank you, Councilmember Montgomery Step. Uh, I uh, just want to thank uh, the folks from from CRC and Greenlining for being here today because I think you know the attendance. We have a lot more public attendance than we usually have. I think that the basis of the work of this organization is really important to understand why are we here, why are we doing this. And uh, some of us have been doing this for so long, we take for granted that people just know what, what the organization is. Um, you know, I, 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 a lot of what we hear about in, you know, I sit on the board of Cal HFA and we have a first time home owner program uh, and challenges oftentimes are the cultural competencies of the, of the mortgage originators. Uh, and so there can be investments made there. Uh, there can be, um, so, and that's one of, actually one of the biggest things that we see. And when we, when we rolled out our program for mortgage, um, both mortgage assistance and for, for uh, uh, foreclosure assistance, making sure that, that we worked with organizations that were culturally competent. And that speaks to the need for, you know, CRA to be maybe more expansive in its look at the world because maybe not, maybe bigger banks are just not set up as large corporate structures to do what NGOs do, what, what community-based organizations can do. And maybe there's partnerships that we can see. Uh, I know that the City Heights CDC does amazing work, that MAC does amazing work. We have CBOs that can do a lot of the work to bridge the gap between those communities that are underrepresented and the institutions that may not be able to, with a national platform, customize their approaches to these communities. So I really appreciate, you know, uh, again, ha having the opportunity to just really blow open the, ex uh, the, the discussion and lay the groundwork for what I hope will be a productive year here at the RTF. Very well said. I, I couldn't agree more with you, everything that you said. Uh, so. Um, if there are no uh, board, no more uh, board member comments, task force member comments. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to our uh, item number eight, which is bank programs for distressed uh, mortgage borrowers. Um, we have entered a new year, but there is still a lot of suffering uh, uh, from COVID nineteen and all of its implications. Last year in April, we heard from our member banks about mortgage relief programs. Um, wanted to revisit the topic this year and hear of any updates or changes uh, to mortgage forbearance. So um, if we could have um, our banks kind of go through, our member banks go through, if there are any updates in this area and then start with um, Bank of America. Good afternoon. Um, there have been no changes to our forbearance. If there are individuals that still need assistance, they are more than welcome to contact us. I did share the link that has all of the information with um, Daisy. And on that particular link, it provides the information not only for mortgages, um, it's also for the credit cards. There's also um, updated video that showcases um, where they can go and they can actually email the head of our consumer department for um, comments, questions, and concerns as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Citibank. Hi, um, thank you for um, the opportunity. We At Citibank, there has been no changes either. Um, all of our mortgage loan servicing continues to be provided by CENLAR. And um, the CENLAR contact number and um, website, um, I will uh, send to the RTF manager um, following the, the meeting. Okay, great, thank you. And let's go to JP Morgan Chase. Can I on the screen here? 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So this is my first meeting, so I feel very privileged to be able to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces and new faces as well. Um, so I don't have the benefit of knowing what was shared previously, so I'll just start from fresh. Um, so customers who have been impacted by COVID can request um, a 90-day initial forbearance plan that could be extended up to 360 days. Uh, we did also provide the links and phone numbers to Daisy earlier, um, even though I can provide some a little um, more background context if that's helpful in an email as well, Daisy. So just let me know. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sure we're going to put, if it's not already up there, we can uh, put links in a place where everyone can reach them for sure. Um, Union Bank. Hang on. Uh, yeah, this is Frank. I'm sorry. I got two screens here. Okay. I didn't hit the mute button, but something else happened. It's another one. Um, so, you know, we've established our COVID-19 uh, resource center on our website. And I want to tell you that the financial assistance programs are in the following areas. It's in the home, loans, business lending, uh, consumer and uh, deposit products and credit cards. And so in around mortgage, we do have our own forbearance page that we, we're really willing to help. We're here to help. And we ask that people go, uh, as, and you can request a forbearance right online and that can go up to six months. And then if you need to be extended up to another six months, it can be. Um, and, but one of the things that we want to tell people is if you are needing help, just call us. You can call us at 1-800-405-1122. Um, the most important thing is just pick up the phone and give us a call. We're here to help. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, U.S. Bank. Um, thank you. It's good to be here. So we've not had any significant changes since... Um, we shared out information in April. Um, we, um, as with everybody else, encourage um, uh, folks to contact us, uh, and we have a number of channels for them to do that, um, both um, both online and by telephone. Um, and there are also messages on billing statements. I've shared all that, all those links um, with Daisy. In addition, um, we include on our website just a link to HUD um, if folks. Um, uh, for whatever reason, just want to talk to a different a different um, resource. Um, and we do have um, uh, within we have specialized default default counselors, and within that unit, we also have you know folks with um, Spanish language capabilities. Um, uh, it, it, but the bottom line is we just encourage people to um, contact us, and we try to provide as many channels to do that as possible. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, we will go to our uh, last bank on the list, Wells Fargo. Thank you. Well, also, uh, no significant changes with Wells Fargo. Uh, I already shared with Daisy the link to the resources for home lending for small business for uh, credit card customers. Uh, we, we have the ongoing program that's suspending <laughs> residential property foreclosure, sales and evictions. Uh, the, we continue offering the, the forbearance program. Um, and just uh, uh, very good news, uh, uh, in December, uh, we announced a, a grant to Acción San Diego. Uh, thanks to the, as if you remember well, Wells Fargo decided to uh, use the fees of the PP program to support small businesses. And uh, we were able to bring $2 million thanks to a really great application from Acción. And I think Elizabeth later, we can, she can share about the details. I'm predicting that we will also be, be able to bring additional money for technical assistance and also uh, by mid-year additional money for other nonprofits that are providing a recovery and resiliency. So hopefully we'll be able to bring uh, additional good news in the near future. Okay, thank you for that. And what um, I, I think this, this is important because as we at the city of San Diego and, and of course other uh, cities, I'm sure at the county, um, when we uh, discuss rent relief and uh, our programs around rent relief, we have a lot of feedback about 
um, mortgage relief. And so what we can do is di distribute information as we um, provide information around rent relief. We can always also provide the links and the information that you all have given us today um, because it is a, it's something that we hear about often. So um, before we, this, this was the presentation, I just wanna give the public the opportunity to uh, comment on this presentation before we move forward. So if there's anyone uh, that is, would like to provide public comment, now is the time. Okay. I think Karen was gonna say there is no public comment. So uh, <laughs> um, we will uh, move forward. Thank you again uh, to our member banks for giving us those updates. So um, let's go to item number three, going backwards now. Uh, if we have any uh, task force member comments, anything that you would like to share, I would like to open up the floor to you now. This, this is Frank Robinson. Uh, I'm, I'm happy and pleased to announce that um, in December, Union Bank received an outstanding rating on our CRA performance. And um, so uh, just excited and thrilled that every member of our, of our corporate social responsibility team, along with the president of the bank, is absolutely thrilled about this. And um, we look forward to bigger and better. This is our second um, CRA outstanding rating consecutively. Great, thank you. And when we start digging in and changing the standards, I know you'll still be at the top. <laughs> well, well, you know, the thing of it is, that's why I asked the question because it's important right. for us to, you know, we need to modernize this. We all recognize that. In fact, um, even my boss had said that, uh, been a big advocate of that. So we just need to do more, do better. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Steven. Thank you. Uh, a, a couple things. One is, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we know November passed. Measure A did not pass, although we got nearly 58 percent of the vote. I'd be happy to at a future meeting, if folks would like uh, a little more organized presentation on some of the outcomes, be happy to give you a briefing. Uh, we've got. And so that's for maybe for a future agenda. I also want to announce. Uh, so we're very pleased. We're, we're just beginning conversations right now with the Center for Excellence, which uh, provides guidance to local community colleges on their curriculum. And we're seeing if we can develop a curricula that will help develop workforce within the sector, within the affordable housing sector. Uh, and so I'm expecting that our February roundtable, uh, roundtable series, by the way, sponsored by US Bank, uh, that our February roundtable will be a gathering of folks from our sector to identify these needs to help the Center of Excellence, the Center of Excellence uh, begin to develop, um, analyze their curriculum and see where there might be gaps, where there might be opportunities to help us reach out to uh, traditionally underserved communities, communities of color, and residents of our own properties uh, to, to enter into career paths in the affordable housing sector. So it's the beginning of a multi-year effort, but I will make sure that everyone on this, on this distribution list gets an invitation to participate in that discussion. We're really excited about this, uh, this moving forward. Thank you. Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. This is Elizabeth from Axion. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, I had a couple of things that I wanted to mention um, just to this group is that um, coming up here in the next week on Wednesday with small businesses, as you all know, we support small businesses, primarily those of low to moderate income, entrepreneurs of color and women with uh, both education and then access to capital through our small business loan programs. And we have an event um, that's that we're hosting in Spanish next Next week on Wednesday the 27th. So I'll put in the chat here in a minute a link to register. It's just information for small businesses that may want to learn about marketing or financing opportunities. Um, it's also particularly geared towards the current environment that we have right now. So that's just for everybody a resource for small businesses. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we as an organization um, 
in the pandemic had uh, worked primarily with the County of San Diego um, Supervisor Fletcher's office, as well as Desmond and Jacob's office um, to administer the San Diego County COVID uh, response and recovery uh, small business loan fund, which was $5 million. And I'm proud to report that we are almost fully done deploying that entire fund. Um, and it initiated with supporting small businesses within the unincorporated area areas and then was opened up countywide um, in the end of September to small businesses in, in San Diego County. And so we are almost fully done deploying that. And so I just wanted to thank um, both the county and, and their support for uh, responding. That was a, a low interest loan product that was a 1% product with six months of no payments initially for small businesses, um, up to $50,000. And I also wanted to thank the many of the member banks. I think almost all of them have supported our organization in being able to respond um, for response and recovery efforts for small businesses at some level with either that program or a statewide program that we're offering that's also COVID uh, relief and recovery for small businesses. So really appreciate everybody's efforts and then I wanted to mention um, two specific grants that two of the member banks um, just recently have provided our organization um, and really wanted to thank them for their amazing support with the, these generous grants. Um, one, Antonio mentioned with Wells Fargo, um, we were a recipient at the end, very end of November for a $2 million grant. Um, which our organization is utilizing specifically for um, relief and recovery for racially and ethnically diverse entrepreneurs um, to access capital. And it's a $1.5 million fund that we have already deployed um, a little over $250,000 of, and we are still taking applications. We have about $700,000 already in the pipeline of applications for that specific product, a low interest loan product. And so we really appreciate the opportunity through Wells Fargo's Open for Business program to be able to respond with that recovery effort for small businesses. And we certainly will share examples with um, this group of small businesses that benefited from from that access. And then I also wanted to take a moment and thank um, Chi and the Citibank team. Um, and we also were a recipient just recently of a $500,000 uh, unrestricted operating grant support to support our organization um, to further the efforts that we're doing in low to moderate income and um, entrepreneurs of color um, with access to capital, both from a COVID response and recovery, as well as our regular loan program. And that was really influenced by, I think, the RTF's focus, too, on racial, racially and, um, you know, equity and economic inclusion as well. So just really wanted to thank um, those two particular partners for the efforts and the investment that they're making in the local community. And we're just happy to be a, a partner and an avenue to get those dollars out on to the streets um, uh, to small businesses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, if you could send uh, either the link or the information that you discussed at the beginning uh, directly to Daisy so that we can sure. make sure it gets out to the public, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other member comments? Okay, well, that was some pretty good news we heard. So um, we can move on now to um, item number four, which is approval of the minutes. And um, at this time, I will entertain a motion for the approval of the November 5th, 2020 special meeting minutes. I'll move the minutes. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, and I'm happy to second that. And so uh, if there is no discussion, we can uh, take a vote. Uh, Daisy, I can just do an up or down, correct? Just a voice vote. Okay. So all in favor say aye. I like the aye. thumbs up. Too. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you so much. That passes unanimously. And we will go to our last item, which is our staff report. Perfect. Thank you very much, Council Member. Let me switch over, please. Um, a welcome to everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to our members and to our alternates. Um, 
we want to, I want to welcome Vera. Um, we still have Sarah as our official member, but um, as you know, we let alternates come in. And so Vera is subbing for Sarah at Chase. And welcome to our new co-chair, Supervisor Anderson. We're very much looking forward to working with you and with your staff who have already been very helpful. So with the new administration, we're already seeing changes at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and other agencies that will be interesting to watch. But we expect to see that agency strengthened after years of reversals, which will be very good for consumer protection. We'll keep you updated on that. Here in San Diego and at the RTF, our biggest project is, as it is every January, promotion of the earned income tax credit and support and outreach for free tax preparation services. As we've discussed previously, this year is a big change because funding that formerly went to tax services has been repurposed to even more urgent COVID needs, such as direct food and rent support. So as we've discussed, that means fewer people will be served by our partner Dreams for Change and the other members of the EITC coalition. In response, we pivoted the program a bit to help people to do their own taxes if they so desire, to build financial empowerment where the client is interested. There is a free online tax program and real help, real time help resources that are available. So we're excited, we're partnering with Dreams of Change. We're going to offer workshops, one introductory, one more hands on in English and in Spanish to help clients who want to do their own taxes. Those classes will start next week. If your organization is interested in sharing word about them um, with your stakeholders, please reach out to me. We will also, the RTF, create the same outreach materials as we've done in the past um, with support from our grant from City to help get out the word about tax preparation. The materials are being updated to include information about doing your own taxes. We'll share those with the RTF in a week or so, and they'll go out to coincide with the opening of the tax season at the end of January. Regarding CRA reform, as we've done um, past with the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, rulemaking that Josh talked about, we will submit a comment letter signed by the co-chairs. If anyone else wants to submit comment for the organization or just to talk to me about submitting comment, um, whether members or mem you know, members of the RTF, members of the public, um, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to help or to direct you to help if you need it. Last, the RTF will again hold its public meetings on a quarterly basis this year with a new chair just appointed two weeks ago. We're still figuring out when those meetings will be, but we will share them as soon as they're available. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Daisy, and again, for all that you do to gather all of us and you know outreach to our presenters, um, everything that you do, thank you. Um, I'm glad we started off this way uh, to center ourselves on, I guess, what um, our focus and foundation is. And so I'm hopeful for a, a good year. Um, and with that, our meeting is adjourned and I will see you all uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.